So next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Patrick uh, Gartner. So um, he studied uh, biology in TUM um, uh, in Germany. So his doctor thesis focused on the animal feeding um, for genetically modified plants uh, from the long-term perspective and uh, from uh, 2009 to 2019, uh, he worked as a project scientist in, at the Bavarian Health and Food Safety Authority, and particularly for the automatic uh, DNA extraction method and the detection method for GMO. And since 2019, so Patrick uh, is responsible for the uh, authentic um, authentic of plant-derived food products and uh, since 2021, so um, he's responsible for monitoring of GM seeds. So uh, also in 2021, he became the chairperson for the German Genetic Engineering Arc uh, Act Working uh, Group. So. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I try to keep in the, in the time frame. Um, <laughs> thank you also to the organizer for inviting me to uh, show our approaches uh, towards um, the development of detection methods for NGT organisms. When I say our approaches, I mean approaches uh, made by the paragraph 28B Genetic Engineering Act Working Group, a long name. Um, and as I assume that most of you are not familiar with the German Genetic Engineering Act, uh, I give you a short, short, uh, or brief introduction uh, with regard to the working group only. Don't worry. Um, so the working group, um, or the, the paragraph 28B of the Genetic Engineering Act, stipulates um, the publication of uh, official methods for sampling and also detection identification of genetically modified organisms. And the working group, the 28B working group, so was established uh, in order to fulfill this purpose. We currently have the main working, oops, the main working group. How does it work here? Oh, okay. Oh, that's tricky, I see. Um, no, I'd, I'd do it without it. Um, so we have the main working group, the 28B, and we have also currently two sub-working groups. The first one dealing with the PCR-based, or the development of PCR-based detection methods. Um, for NGTs, and the, and the other subworking group is dealing with NG, NGS-based method for GMOs in general, so NGTs and also classical GMOs. And the working group itself consists of experts from um, official control authorities, uh, from the industry, and from this, from research. And I know that normally the words of thanks are said at the end of, the, of a talk. I would use the opportunity to do that right now, to thank all the members uh, and the guests of the working group uh, for their efforts, for their hard work in developing uh, all the methods that I'm going to present here. Without them, I wouldn't stand here and present all the results. So thank you very much for all the members and the guests of the working group for their hard work, and also all the, all the members and guests from the, from the BVL. Um, for the organization, for all the work in the National Reference Laboratory, and especially also Lutz Grohmann, who's here, that I'm quite happy for. Welcome, Lutz. Great to have you here. Okay, though so, uh, we heard a lot of, of the challenges for method development, method um, development and NGT detection. So I'm talking here in the, with a focus on the official control um, work that we're doing. Though we have, first of all, as we already, I think, agree, agreed on, um, we have the need for collecting information on the NGT. Without information on the G NGT, we're not able to develop um, methods for the detection and identification, especially information regarding the modification itself, the technique that was used for incorporating that mod modification. And it would be perfect to have um, well-structured and well-characterized sequence information regarding that um, NGT organism. Um, having this information on hand, um, one could work with uh, synthetic plasmids, depending on the sequence information, of course, um, to de start developing and optimizing uh, methods. 
The main problem with synthetic plasmids is that you don't know if the sequence information that you have on hand really reflects the actual situation of the NGT that is really marketed. Yeah, you have no idea about that. Um, so it might be a starting point. It would be preferred, of course, to have material either provided by the, by the companies, the producers, um, commercially available material, or um, ideally it would be certified reference material, which we don't have at the moment, as you all know. Um, and from starting that, you can, you can do a, a development uh, of, of methods for the modification-specific um, detection. Screening method we heard before is quite tricky, as we don't have common genetic elements incorporated in, into um, the NGTs. I, I will show on the next slide uh, and first try to develop a, a screening method for a, at least CRISPR-based uh, detection. Uh, and then we have, of course, the development of specific detection, which should be suitable for routine analysis, of course, as I'm from a uh, routine analysis lab. Um, and they should also comply, of course, with the NPR um, requirements. But what, we, what we've seen uh, during our approach is that um, we might also think out of the box when it comes to the classical qPCR, digital PCR applications. So we have to uh, apply also innovative methods and also new approaches that I'm going to present in a few minutes. The identification is still an open question, as you, I think all of you are aware, but that will be then the final step uh, in that process. So starting with the screening, uh, we heard before that it's almost impossible or impossible to screen for, for NGT organisms. What we thought at the beginning um, when we worked with NGTs um, and CRISPR as the, the most prominent NGT, um, that we could target at least um, common sequences of CRISPR applications. So in, in, the, in, the, um, in single guide RNA, we have two or guide RNA, we have two parts, a bit simplified, I know, but two parts that could be a potential target for screening, that is the protospacer and a so-called scaffold uh, region. The protos protospacer leads the Cas enzyme to the position where the double strand break occurs, so that is highly variable and not really a target for uh, development of a method. Though the scaffold sequence, the scaffold coding sequence, um, that is rather, um, homologue and, and uh, could be a target for, for an application and is mainly derived from Streptococcus, Streptococcus pyogenes and Staphylococcus aureus in different applications. So that was for us uh, a target in the development of a detection method. Uh, two members of our working group um, developed methods for Streptococcus pyogenes based. It's not 100% identical to that, um, but uh, Streptococcus pyogenes based uh, Scaffold, scaffold RNA sequence and the Staphylococcus aureus based sequence. And that method were developed, optimized, and now in, we have an ongoing interlaboratory inter trial with 14 participating laboratories uh, throughout Europe, so mainly Germany, but also Austria, Switzerland, and Italy. We are well aware that um, the applications are very limited for this, for this method, so for feed, food, and seed, analysis might not be applicable, especially in routine analysis. However, for monitoring stably transformed uh, NGT plants, also for uh, ornamental plants that was discussed yesterday, and um, monitoring the activities in uh, genetic engineering facilities, that might be an option um, to, do, to do monitoring. Beside that, we have um, focused on four different NGT plants for which we could get at least some information. Um, I think all of, all of them have, have been mentioned before, though you have the, the oil seed rape from Cybers with a single base substitution, the um, Kalino soybean from Calyx uh, with small deletions, the Cortiva waxy corn that we've heard uh, uh, before today, and the Sanatec seed uh, Gava tomato with a, with a single base insertion. Um, for the herbicide tolerant um, oilseed rape, we have um, a single base substitution it, in the AHES 1C and 1.3 gene variants. So we have the same single base mutation in two gene variants. And unfortunately, we have conventional oilseed rape lines that have the same mutation, at least in the AHES 3.1 uh, gene variant. 
So for us, it's a challenge not only to detect that single base substitution, but also to discriminate or distinguish uh, the 40K gene, genome edited oilseed rape and the clear field uh, oilseed rape that were produced conventional. We're currently working on, on qPCR, NGS digital PCR method. We have a, a poster um, outside from, from the lab, Christian Weidner, Sof um, Sophia Edelmann, that show a digital PCR approach, which is very promising. I'm quite happy for that. Um, we still have a bit problem with the qPCR um, Q -PCR assays, and for NGS, we um, we were quite happy at the beginning, but we came to a lot of challenges that, uh, that made us stop with the NGS application in that respect because of the complexity of the, um, the RAPE-C genome, um, the homologous um, 1, 1C and 3A gene variants of the AHES, and we were not able to really map the sequence correctly without losing much information due to the filtering. And we also had a lot of chimeric um, sequences that made, made us uh, yeah, caused, caused a lot of problems when, when we made the NGS applications. And we have also now uh, additional mutations that we're looking for and taking into account uh, to have um, combined detection approaches that also um, are presented in the digital PCR-based um, poster outside by Christopher Weidner and Sophia Edelmann. So one, one aspect in that respect, when I thought at that at the beginning that we have to think outside the box and use new innovative methods, we have um, a project at the LGL that is done by my colleague Stefan Heinz at the moment. It's funded by the Bavarian State Ministry of the Environment and Consumer Protection that deals with um, new approaches, innovative approaches. And um, as, a, as a suggestion by a colleague from Planton, Martin Weigel, um, we try to apply um, so-called uh, dual priming oligos, uh, which are shown here on the left, um, which consists of uh, or contain two parts that, that are important. The first one on the left hand is the stabilizer. That's quite similar to a normal primer. And on the right side, we have the determiner, which is quite short, and which binding effic eff efficiency depends on the correct binding of um, this determiner to the SNV, or the mutation that you, you have at that position. And those two parts are combined um, by a linker uh, of inosines. And what um, a mismatch cause would be that the determiner would not bind correctly and you would not get an, an efficient amplification or an amplification at all. We were quite, um, yeah, yeah, well, it surprised us that it didn't work in the beginning um, because it looked, it looked so promising. Um, so we started with a high content of, um, of the 440K cypress rape seed and uh, Clearfield var uh, variant DNA. And what you see on top here on, on, the, uh, on the figure that's also provided by data by Stefan Heinz, um, you see the different um, optimization steps that we did and the gray circle with the, with the number in it, that's the delta CQ between a 40K uh, DNA and the clear field DNA, the conventional clear field DNA. So with just uh, using dual priming oligos, we just got a delta CQ of one, which is not, not really a specific difference between those two DNAs. But um, by combining different, different uh, technic techniques, different oligos, master mix products, chemistries, and so on, um, we could increase the delta CQ from 1 to 19. So when starting with a, with a CQ of 20 roundabout, 19 is almost, I would say, almost uh, close to specificity. And for that, we also used a high discrimination polymerase that is also an, a nice polymerase that needs a, a perfectly fitting three prime end um, of the prime in order to amplify your DNA. So in combination with LNA, LNA bases, um, inosine, dual priming oligos, different master mix products and so on, we could increase at least the specificity. So maybe that, that's a an, an way we can apply in, in different applications when we develop new, new techniques for NGTs. For the colino, um, situation was, was a bit different because we don't have any material on hand for, for, um, for this Kalino soybean. So we're working with synthetic plasmids based on a publication that showed uh, two deletions, one in the FAT21A and one in the two, uh, FAT21B gene variants. 
And my former colleague, Daniel Noises, designed um, primers and probes, a uh, universal probe in this case, um, spanning, spanning that deletion. Um, and we also in-house validated that method um, and found no unspecific amplification with certified reference material. And also in interlaboratory trials, we also uh, saw no amplification with wild-type uh, soybean DNA, so it's highly specific and um, quite sensitive with a detection limit of around about three to five copies per PCR, very good PCR efficiency according also to the MPR requirements. And in the robustness, we found uh, small differences uh, when, when using different qPCR instrument, which is not a surprise. Um, otherwise, it fulfills the requirements of robustness tests also. Um, and an interlaboratory inter trial is also planned for uh, 2023 or this year. Okay, the waxy comb we have heard a lot about today, that's also one target um, that we're dealing with. Um, for that, we have sequence information based on, on the publication that um, showed different lines with different uh, deletion in that gene, and we assumed that the 4KB deletion will be the, the most market relevant uh, line in that publication. Um, and we were lucky thanks also to Corteva AcriScience to provide material uh, under a, a MTA. And also in the publication, the, the detection method is, uh, is published. So we are currently verifying this um, detection method based on the MPR requirements if they fill the requirements. So that's at the moment the, the situation. I cannot show you a lot of data due to the MTA. I'm sorry for that. Um, and the last, the last NGT, NGT product that I'm going to introduce is the high GABA tomato that was also mentioned before. Um, for that, we had sequence information regarding the, the gene that was uh, modified, um, but did not know the exact position of the uh, modification. Um, we just knew that it was a one base pair insertion. And we knew that CRISPR was, was used in the, uh, to produce that uh, GABA tomato. Um, so Lutz Grohmann was the one who took uh, a, a bioinformatic tool, CRISPR-P, to predict, based on this information, um, the potential insertion site of, of the uh, one base pair in that gene. And um, in the meantime, we also got positive material um, available, though DNA and seed material that was provided. Um, and the um, effect of the one base pair insertion is that we get a frame shift um, as a new stop codon is formed and then a so-called auto-regulatory C-terminus is not produced anymore and that normally regulates the GABA content, so the GABA content is increased due to that one base pair insertion. And from the material that we got, um, we started quick and dirty to do DNA sequencing, standard Sanger sequencing, no, so no NGS at the beginning. Um, just to see if the, um, the insertion side was correctly predicted. And what we found was perfectly fitting uh, sequence amplification signals, uh, sequencing signals, sorry, uh, until a certain position. And that was exactly the position that was predicted by the bioinformatic tool. And um, also due to information from publication, it was said that the most uh, inserted base is a T. And what we also found was that T that we predicted at the beginning to be inserted at that certain position. So it is possible with knowing the technique and the uh, modification that was introduced to predict at least with a very high statistical significance um, where the, where the mutation um, should occur, and which kind of mutation. And that was also um, uh, underlined by NGS detection um, method by my Martin Weigler Planton, and they also developed now an NGS pipeline for the detection for official controls, um, and that will be tested also in an interlaboratory uh, trial. We'll see if we can finish that this year or next year, we'll see. Um, how fast the developmental process will go on. And also for those laboratories that don't have an NGS um, unit at hand, um, we also consider developing qPCR and digital PCR methods um, in order to detect um, this single insertion. 
So to sum that up, the methods that we have on hand, we have the oilseed rape where we have um, information regarding the modification. We have positive mod material provided by, by the company. And we have different kind of methods, qPCR, digital PCR. Unfortunately, not NGS, but um, at least qPCR and digital PCR that are close to, to a um, good specificity, specificity and are very uh, sensitive at the moment, though we're working on that. Um, talking about the identification in the on the next slide, which will also be my last one. Um, for soybean, we have a different situation. We have information regarding the, um, the deletions. Unfortunately, we don't have positive material, though we're working on synthetic plasmids. Um, but we have a quite robust and specific um, detection method on hand, which could be used in, in routine analysis. And that could be, as we are targeting two deletions, it could be coming close to an identification. Unfortunately, there's uh, another line by, uh, by Calix that um, has a third deletion. So it has the same two deletions that we're targeting, but has a third deletion. So with our method, we could not distinguish um, these, two, these two lines. Um, but still, it would be an identification of a Calix-based um, soybean. Um, for Corteva AgriScience, um, again, we have information, at least regarding um, to the publication. We have positive material, which was kindly provided. Um, we have the method that was provided also by Corteva. And due to the large deletion of 4KB, um, that is really close to, uh, to an identification method of, of that um, NGT product. And for the GABA tomato, same is the same. We have a, sequence information that is now verified by NGS and also by normal sequencing. Um, we have positive material for that NGT and we have a NGS pipeline that's in development by Planton. Um, so we are at least um, at the position of having a detection method, not an identification method. And we're um, having a screening for the guide RNA, at least with a limited scope when it comes to the applicability uh, in routine analysis. And now, my really last slide, um, what, is signif what, is the, what are the significance, um, significance of an analytical result um, when we're applying the detection method that we, um, that we developed? Well, first of all, but that's, something, that's something we heard a lot. Um, it's a case-by-case -case decision, depending on the mutation and the NGT. So um, when thinking back to the, Cali uh, to the, to the Cybers rape seed, um, we have the identical SNV produced uh, through conventional breeding. So we have a high probability of the occurrence um, of the same mutation, also due to the selection pressure. It's an herbicide-tolerant rapeseed, so when using extensive, uh, extensive use of herbicides leads to a high um, pressure regarding the same mutation. So detecting this mutation has not a real high significance. So for that, we definitely need a combination of detection method also targeting um, the intended but also the unintended mutation. So we need multi-target approaches at least for those, uh, those kind of NGTs. And when using methods for the uh, detection of undetended and spontaneous mutations, those have to be accurately characterized as we heard before. They should be or must be stably linked to the locus of the intended mutations and they must be maintained through the breeding process. And for that, I think we need a lot more sequence information, pan-genome sequence information, and that will be hard work left for us for the next years. And I finish with that, thanking you for the, for the attention. Again, thanking all the mem members and uh, guests of the working group. Thanking all the colleagues at the LGL, uh, my colleagues at the lab, Sven Pecoraro, Ingrid Huber. Um, thank you a lot for the, for the support. And thank you for the organizers for having this wonderful conference and lead us back in real life and lead us back together for the conversation and the, the discussion. Thank you very much.